das Vaterland und uns schimmert Leben, uns starken Schicken und ins Unfallen, uns ihre großen deutschen Soldaten, sie bezöden uns ihre Pferden. Natürlich alle zu denen müssen gefunden worden. Und diesen guten Soldat muss essen! Er muss essen! Er muss essen! Er muss essen! World War II is back on the menu with not that many pieces actually. Um, and decks of cards for each faction? Yeah, this is Axis and Allies Food Edition Field by Cards. It has Axis versus Allies, okay, duh, typical. It's got a map of the world, okay, typical, but wait, wait, what, what's this? There's no dice, but instead you have a hand of cards? And you play one card every turn for everything, including combat? Uh, oh, and then you have to supply your troops or else they starve to death? Yeah, this is definitely different than what we grew up with. Well, let's roll into this game all about feeding your hungry, hungry soldiers to change the course of history. Let's get into it. Just like in Axis and Allies, here you want to crush your enemies and tear them to pieces. As Axis, you want to kill the Allies. As Allies, you want to kill the Axis. Just get two enemy capitals and you instantly win. The Germans can move it to Moscow to overtake the motherland, or the Americans can go to the land of the rising sun and take Japan. Or just capture as many star areas as possible and hold them to maximize amount of points you get per round. Kind of like World War II stuff, right? Okay, but this game is doing an interesting proxy war because while you are placing ships and troops around, you're not really doing all the nuts and bolts of war. Here we go, the Quartermaster. Yeah, I don't know why it shows Patton here, but basically the Quartermaster is the dude that cooks all the grub to supply your troops during war so they don't go hungry. So this game, Quartermaster General, is all about supplying your troops. Units can only stay on the board if they're connected by other units to a supply station with that big golden star. Basically your home base, or a major region. So if your supply line gets cut and you can't fix the hole at the end of your turn, all of your unsupplied units just disappear. Now to do anything in this game, you're gonna be using your hand of cards that gets replenished by your nation's deck. On your turn, all you do is you pick a card, one card for your hand and you play it and it does the thing, that's it. Now this could be anything from building an army to battling to using all the special cards that each nation does have. Whichever team, Axis, or Allies has more points after 20 rounds wins the game. That's all you need to know about this game for now. Now on to the review, starting with the pros. And first and foremost, this game just nails the component simplicity. Each of the differently colored wooden pieces are either tank or ship, and they look great on the clean map of the world. All of the nations have their own deck with like, really thick cards. They're not too thick, so they feel uncomfortable in the hand, but reasonably thicker than most cards you'd find in other games. Really nice to see that these will probably last a while. To store all of these cute components, there's a very, very clean insert where for each faction, you just plop down their pieces and then put the decks on top. Points and round markers go in the middle. Then you just put the game board on top of it all. This is gonna help the ultra fast setup even more. All you're doing for this game is getting your deck putting one unit down in your capital, then drawing cards. The point trackers go on and the round marker and then that's it. Really fast, especially considering I've had some really finicky memories with Axis and Allies. This takes probably like three minutes at most by yourself. So now we get to gameplay. And to kick it off, we're gonna talk about these six separate asymmetric decks that you're gonna be using to supply all your battle lines. These all specialize a little bit differently. Here's a taste. Genema, pizza. We fight side by side with the Germans to dominate the other Europeans. Then, the glory of Italy will show its colors as Mare Nostrum and the Imperio Italio bring pride back to the days of Roma. Wanna do Taiyoshida de Shire? 
ティコテスナ、トキノバンザイコゲキ、オシンゴユズニキヨホ、トリモリシャレマス、アメリカヒティオ、ニスタレワ、シンパシンドデクダサイ。ああ、ガナ、ウェルブレッシャンバイルネブセツァウェイ、ウェルプレイオプションズオルトイム。We can fight in Australia and India, and of course, work with them dumb cowardly Frenchies who will slow down the Germans. Keep calm and carry on, is what I always say. In Soviet Russia, the Red Army never falters. The Germans are pushing hard, but we will survive through our endless wave of women conscripts and Red Guards. Then, when the time is right, we will launch a full frontal assault to sweep into Berlin. Here, world war, and we're gonna have to work another time with Rosie the Riveter to get us over to Europe. But you know, also to Asia, because some Japanese are on Hawaii real hard. We have superior shipyards and aircraft carriers to get our Yankee boys over to them shores. To do all these cool things with all these factions, the game is super, super simple on your turn. The main course of your turn is you pick a card from your hand, you play it, and that's it. Let's say I build an army. Just place an army next to where I have dudes. Bam, that's it. That's basically my turn. That means that just about everything in this war looking game, from spawning units to fighting to using nation special abilities, doesn't require special phases, special counters, or even dice. All you want to do, if you want to fight, play a card. Unit dies. Bam. So, despite all the asymmetry in all these decks, this game is actually super easy to teach. And learn, which is crazy awesome for a World War II themed game. And to learn this game, the rulebook is rather nice. It doesn't have a dedicated fact, but it does does have plenty of examples and is rather pleasing to look at. Within this framework of just playing one card a turn, the game actually gives you plenty of diverse options to plan all your cool wartime schemes. Let's start with the response cards. These response cards are like traps. If you want to, on your turn, you can take an action to take this card, put it down face down in front of you so no one else knows what it is. Then, when the time is right, you can flip over your trap card to surprise your opponents. You can do stuff like defending the motherland to going aggressive with a Japanese bonsai attack in Central Asia. There's also stuff called event cards to do cool things on the board. Every nation has different quantities of build and attack cards. Yeah, the strategy for each nation really starts getting fun. But then there's going to be the backbone of so many more cool things with these status cards. These are littered in every nation. So to play them, yeah, you just put them down in front of you. But then they're always in play. Forever! So, on any turn after, you have an option to use that ability, like the Germans blitzing to build after they fight. These are super awesome to just stack and have a bunch in front of you. If you have the Germans with that Blitzkrieg card, bias for action, and dive bombers, that means if you just play one attack card, that can lead to the initial attack, then blitzing to build where you just attacked, then bias for action to build again, then dive bombing to attacking again. Yeah, all from one card. This is the insane threat that the Soviets may be dealing with almost all game. Or how about the other economic powerhouse, the Americans? They can just extend like crazy in the Pacific Ocean with their aircraft carrier status. All of these permanent abilities that some of the status cards unlock mean that the nations want to think about using turns to build up with these statuses, but you can't just turtle in your capital, waiting for all your statuses until you feel strong enough, then strike. Because this game constantly invites conflict. You're gonna constantly be keeping track of points in this game. And a way to get a bunch of points is to use some of the Axis status cards. And these tell them to basically go out and conquer the world. It's like to bring glory to their. St I don't know, the Axis are weird. These status cards don't give you another action per se, but they do give you points if you control certain areas, like the Japanese controlling Hawaii to get points. Yeah, that, that sounds like conflict for sure. The Axis are gonna branch out to get all these points as quickly as possible, and the Allies will be struggling to stop them, especially because the Americans are pretty isolated from the rest of the board. And this is where all the awesome war fronts are gonna come up in this game. 
see, there's a grand scale European and Pacific fronts in World War II, but this game is going to have the smaller ones in between, like Africa and China. One reason is because of inherent point value, like the Gold Star India just gives you points for owning it. Or maybe you have a status card that is telling you to go pillage that Pacific island. But another reason for all these varied fronts is because you may need to conquer some places first to get points later. See, there's special straits on the board that are closed off to the bad guy Axis, unless they own that land. That means that if Germany or Italy ever want to send ships to send their Japanese brethren in Asia, they gotta launch a Middle Eastern campaign for the Suez Canal. And the map interaction doesn't just stop with these cards to give you motivation, there's also cards to guide you to these fronts. There's cards that let you transport units weirdly, or to spawn them unconventionally. Britain has cards that let them use Australia, or even India as deployment centers, so instead of spawning around Great Britain, well, they can just spawn over there. Or Russia has a card that doesn't require its units to be supplied, which is really really gonna open up the game. Or how about half the factions have a card that lets them just pick up a bunch of units and then place them in a new way. Yep, America can just be like, oh uh, yeah, you know, it's time to do a theater shift, boys. Pick up all their seamen from the Pacific, and bam, we're going hard on Germany now because Patton wants to advance in Europe. This is an amazing undertaking with how all of these cards work together to create these grand scale fronts. Because there's no concept of gasoline or looting areas, but yet nations are still fighting over valuable regions, which really sells that World War theme. And of course, planning all these frontal battles is going to lead back to the mechanic of, well, you gotta supply your men. This is an amazing idea because it first sells that concept that units just can't be fighting wherever without being connected to some type of resource. But also it gives you that tension where you don't want to overextend your line because if you get flanked and you can't defend it or fill in the hole, there's going to be consequences. See, the supply lines are like lines and well, if there's a hole in the line, the rest of the line gets screwed. So if you're Italy trying to do their historically garbage attempt to attack North Africa, if Britain is able to knock out your navy supplying your faraway troops, those troops are goners. Also, 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 the supply depots are typically your capital, so you want to defend that, because if that gets knocked out, your troops are also goners. Really fun swings that can happen. The multiple fronts that you all have to account for are going to leave you between a rock and a hard place on deciding where to commit. And you only have one card to do so on your turn, so pick carefully. Another thing you want to do carefully is the quantity of units you're placing down. See, every nation has a unit cap. And once all those troops are on the board, well, you can't place any more units unless you kill a unit and place it again, which is really inefficient. So you can't just be everywhere at once and you're stretched even more on where do you want to commit. Should the British help in Europe or help out America and Asia? Should Germany launch a massive assault on Moscow or maybe they should put pressure on England? Each faction has different fronts they can pursue and it all depends on what card you draw and how your teammates are doing. Oh, and then the supply theme doesn't just end on the board. A huge part of this game is that your deck is also your nation's supply. Your economy can bleed dry, and then your nation can't draw, and you'll eventually run out of cards in your hand. And to delve deeper into this, there's plenty of economic damage you can do on your opponents, especially the Axis, to try to deck them out. The Americans especially excel in this, using all sorts of bombers to shed four, or maybe even seven cards from a deck which really puts the clamps on the Axis to get an early lead. The whole running dry idea is especially going to make you second guess using some of the really cool statuses we talked about earlier. There's almost always a dead cost to using these, as maybe you want to use dive bombers as the Germans to attack again, and then you gotta pay up. Or you may really want to use the British status Free France, where you discard two cards from your hand to build an army in France. So then you're drawing more cards from your deck, and it's gonna burn out faster. And since you don't reshuffle your economy once it's used up, that means once you play a card, it's gone forever. So yeah, maybe you want to be careful about triggering all these statuses 
that require you to pay more cards or, you know, take cards off the top of your deck. And uh, maybe, I don't know, what status should I use? Uh, there's so many options just from playing one card a turn. Oh, and there's plenty of mind games going on here too. If we go back to the response cards, they're all completely hidden until they're played. And they may or may not even be that good, but they're gonna scare the hell out of any American trying to invade the Pacific. Of course, there's always the typical pretending that you have a good hand, even when you don't really have one. And then let's say you just go really aggressively to try to scare your opponents. And then maybe Moscow gives up their plans to do a frontal assault on Germany because now the Japanese are really close to attacking him and he wants to prevent himself from getting flanked. The mind games get even more fun when you play this game in teams where you can't see what the other team has as you try to get a read on three hands of cards. There's no quarterbacking because you can't ever see your teammates hands, but you always have to communicate to win. There's even some cards that will give your teammates action. So yeah, just keep talking about all the different fronts and all your plans. You can only ever trace supply through your own pieces. So you gotta make sure your teammates pieces aren't blocking your future attacks. On the one end, you got the German and Italian butt buddies trying to conquer Europe. And then the US is asking how much help Europe really needs or if they should go and slow down the Japanese. Oh, and then if someone is in deep trouble, you better bail them out because that's one entire action your team isn't getting. And luckily, the two nations that are likely to get invaded, Germany and Italy, are right next to each other. So the weirdos they are can just help out their dictator buddy just like that. Pizza time! Also, if you're out of cards, well, chances are the game is going to end soon anyways, so not a big deal if you're out. So player elimination isn't a big deal. And all this team play with the talking and asymmetry for up to six people actually flows well. Your one turn action tends not to drag, then you just check if your supply line is still healthy, then you just get points, real simple, and then every so often, once it goes back to Germany's turn, you just move up the round tracker. That's it. So low downtime means that Quartermaster General actually runs true to its one and a half to two hours projected time. Especially once you know all the cards. Oi. Real quick on replayability here, you always start in the same location because it's World War II. But the order in which you draw cards is always going to change your priorities. The team play is going to be different depending on what strategies your friends like to pursue. And if anything else, you can just play another nation. And bam, whole new deck to think about. The game also initially ramps up really well. Since you can only build or battle next to where you have troops, well, the more dudes you have on the board, the more opportunities just come up. And then you throw in the navies with the huge sea spaces and you can see that the swing of controlling just one more region means a lot. The games will start with nations initially playing some status cards or starting to venture into the fronts. Then a couple turns later, there'll be so many more options with more wooden pieces to use as jumping off points as your hand possibilities keep changing. The initially enlarging armies just throw all these questions at you. Do you play a response card now? Or a status card to get points next turn? Or should you just launch your attack right this moment? All these pros wrap up to have Quartermaster General just have this macro, zoomed out sense of the war, while being very streamlined and you're constantly checking these supplies on the board and also how many cards you have left in your deck, which is a supply of in itself. This leads into the gameplay meeting that World War II theme pretty darn well. There's limited economic resources in your decks, multiple fronts are guaranteed to open up, whether it be China or the Indian Ocean. The cards will continually encourage thematic flavor, like General Patton moving in Europe, Africa Corps to open the Straits up, or hell, what about the Russians helping out a Red Revolution in China? So now let's get to the cons. And to begin, this game, this very card-centric game, can initially be confusing on the strength of cards. See, for newcomers, if they don't understand what type of cards to expect or the consequences of using their last build army card, the game can initially feel very unsubstantial at first as they just play whatever feels right and then later on boring as they run out of all their best cards and they just kind of have to sit around not doing much. 
Basically, the game can feel like a cycle of take that without a full comprehension of what all these cards do in the macro scale that Quartermaster General is. What would really help this is that if each player had a player aid, kind of like on the size of this turn sequence thing, that tells them this is what to expect for each faction, this is the amount of cards, this is kind of the general theme. So then the Japanese player can be like, oh, okay, okay, I just can't throw around my troops nilly willy because I don't have that many build army cards. So then I need to play a lot of defensive response cards. Uh, sir? Oh. I found an explanation, sir. What's that, Private? We, I found it too. It's here in the rule book. Oh, this is in the rule book? Are we supposed to be reading the rule book at the same time as we're playing? Oh, hey, yeah, that, this is actually really good. Yep, all the game needs to do is to smack this onto six pieces of cardboard and give it to players. Then newcomers won't feel so directionless in this easy to learn, but very interconnected game. That's it for the cons, now it's time for the nitpicks. And the first one is that this very card-centric game can stagnate pretty hard with a bad hand. There are cool cards that are region specific, but then when you can't use them, they just kind of clog up your hand. Or there's a problem of not drawing that one build army card you need to launch your entire expedition, and then you just kind of sit there not doing much. There's a couple things this game did to reduce this. First, you start the game with 10 cards, then this card down to 7. Okay, so then you have some control over your opening hand. Cool, but then you can still get screwed by drawing a garbage hand, like having no build cards. Or you can discard as many cards as you want at the end of your turn to let you draw even more cards when you draw back up to 7. Another similar option is that you can trade 4 cards in your hand for any one build or battle card before your turn. Now these methods of discarding cards kinda solves the problem by presenting you with a fun trade-off. You can hurt your late game, but then give you a current short-term benefit. However, this still does punish your economy for having bad draws, which feels poopy. Due to the card-driven nature of the game, Sometimes Germany will have all of its statuses it really needs to get a lead early on on the bottom of the deck, and then it struggles really hard to crush Moscow. Schnell. To make this less likely, the game should just take something out of Magic the Gathering, an optional mulligan. You're still gonna draw 10 cards, but you gotta keep this second hand. This would make those really weird scenarios of Germany having none of its essential statuses way less likely. The next nitpick is that this game can't have some pacing issues, but hey, you know, like, World War II isn't supposed to be a super smooth scaling adventure anyways, right? While comebacks definitely are possible through the right cards and teamwork, with the open information, sometimes it just feels obvious what side is going to win. There's no comeback mechanics, there's no dice rolls to pray for, and then, you know, if you're getting screwed by economic warfare, well, chances are, the opponent is probably at the doorstep of your capital anyways. Like, say Germany is getting its face bashed in, Italy is barely hanging on with no more cards to draw, but the allies can't push hard enough to capture both their capitals and win the game. And this can all happen about halfway through, so then you gotta play like 8 more rounds of one side, just having its boot on someone else's neck. Like, the game should be over by now, right? Bella vita. The rulebook does say that the game ends immediately once one side has a 30 point lead, but 30 points is a lot in this game. Due to the nature of building and supply units, it can be hard to extend for points even though it is clear that you're winning the game. Perhaps something tighter for more casual playgroups that don't play in tournaments is that if you have a 15 point lead, then the game ends. Or maybe if you have a 20 point lead for the Axis, since they do have a stronger early game. Remember, this pacing issue is in the nitpicks because at the end of it all, it's pretty darn thematic. And sometimes in war, you're getting bashed in and there's not much you can do and your, your country decides not to surrender. That's just how it is. Another nitpick that you might have seen is that the card art is not always that varied. See, the art for some categories of cards are always the same. And then the background is changed just a bit to reflect the flag of that nation. These definitely get the job done, but don't necessarily do a great job of immersing you within each faction. Like, especially when you're sitting across the table, it would have been so much more fitting to see aircraft carriers on that aircraft carrier card, or then maybe even a picture of India for the British card that talks about it. The last nitpick is that the theme in this game doesn't 
always make complete sense, but eh, it's a super streamlined game, so this is kind of whatever. Just thought I'd bring it up. Italy should not be doing all the cool things they do in this game, but you know, it's for balance and to give someone an actual shot to play a game. Plus they do have the smallest number of units, so that's pretty cool. Likewise, America feels like they should have access to more troops or maybe a bigger deck, but you know, for balance reasons, so they don't just like blow Japan out of the water. As a whole, your units are wooden tanks and naval ships, which is cool, but they're actually supply units and then they're attacking each other? My ship just shot down all your dudes on land. What? My truck driver carrying food is now launching bonsai attacks? Haha, <laughs> surprise, right? Funnily enough, aside from the rulebook mentioning that an army marches on its stomach, the game doesn't really have much mention of food or water in the cards. It's overall best to not think too hard about how your supply troops are giving food to whoever the heck is fighting these battles, and to just enjoy the streamlined game. Now it's time for the recommender score, where we try to critically evaluate the game given the aforementioned pros and cons. And Quartermaster General World War II is going to get a 9 out of 10 from us. It's excellent! It can at times feel like World War II, but should 100% not be approached with the expectation of getting that full war experience. I mean, this is a game that finishes within 2 hours for 6 people. For as intimidating as this box cover is and how it sounds like Quartermaster General, uh, that sounds a little daunting, right? Well, this game is not daunting at all. It's super easy to set up and learn. Streamlining your decisions to one card a turn is the massive cutting that this game does. Sure, this can sometimes cut realism or leave you victim to bad draws. But then again, you can always trade in your cards with the four for one trade which is where the other supply idea of making your deck your nation's economy works wonderfully. You must always, always, always be so mindful of what you're playing, what your opponent's military capabilities are, and maybe if someone is within range for some economic warfare bombing to bleed their decks. Battles may not always appear epic as just one unit dies, but could be ginormous on the grand scale of things as the Japanese don't have a build navy to fill in that gap, and their army in Southeastern Asia just starves. Again, just one card can do so many things in this game. The status abilities will stack over time, and then you can play a response card face down to give you an advantage later, and no one else knows what it is, and then you can give your teammates actions through these cards. Brilliant. Yep, Quartermaster General does some fun workarounds to make this World War II food edition game so easy to finish. Remember, there's just one wooden piece per square, you just play a card to kill things, and that's that. No dice rolling, which is really going to excite some people. There's also the simplicity of not much component overhead, with no unit counters, no unit abilities, no multiple phases. Hell, even this small turn order summary makes it look more complicated than it really is. You're going to learn so much about the 6 unique decks with repeat plays, and the planning will become even more interesting. As the Americans, you can try to wipe out Germany and Italy early if you think Japan has a slow start. You don't really know entirely though because maybe they're setting traps and have a really good hand. Or maybe they have a bad hand. But remember, if you go hard on Europe, you'll lose the point income from not mobilizing the western US early on. Is that something you're okay with? Would you be okay with Japanese soldiers walking around California? As for player count, this game 100% shines at 6 players, 3 people per team. So then everyone can control their own deck, which is each nation, and that's where the teamwork and the mind games really do come through. But it does work with less, and even down to 2. You just have to be okay with losing some of the mind games, the simplicity, and the teamwork with the less people you have. With less than 6, someone is going to have to think for 2 or 3 nations at once, drawing cards from one deck, thinking for one nation, and then thinking for the other. So if you play this game with just two people, one guy is controlling three decks, so they'll have perfect information of the hands of one side, which can be cool if you want to go super wartime general with a clear plan. And then you can have this game with the World War II scope finish under an hour. Again, the fact that Quartermaster General is able to fit a fairly strong World War II theme inside a two hour box for six 
is an amazing feat. Because it's so accessible, just dragging your friends to get to that six player count. There are so many cool opportunities for just working together as you constantly talk with your teammates about what's in your hand, what's in their hand, what do you think the opponent's doing, the list just goes on and on. Along the way, with your easily digestible sessions, you'll see so many World War II what ifs. What if Italy brings ships to Australia to attack the British there? Maybe England mobilizes India to enter the war on turn one. What if Japan launches an invasion of Russia? All of this with just the simple idea of feeding your troops. Really fantastic. If you want some more mechanics, there's always the expansion to also get. Now we haven't tried this, so we can't really speak much on it, but it adds air superiority as a mechanic, which means you can have multiple units on a space, which is really going to change strategy. My personal score for Quartermaster General is going to be a 7 out of 10. I have a good time with it. I really, really, really like World Wars as a theme. Like, so much that I haven't gotten rid of my Axis and Allies copy from... I don't know, like, seven years ago at this point? Like, man, I just have a soft spot for this stuff. Like, 1940s Grand War. The problem with these World War II games for me is that... Well, I don't always think they have the best pacing, and I don't really get to finish them. Like, I remember in college where we played Axis and Allies for, like, the entire Saturday, and no one ended up winning, which is kind of dumb. The dice rolling just gets kind of boring, the game never ends. Yeah, that's Axis and Allies. But, Quartermaster General, the simplicity in this game, whew, yeah. I was immediately hooked. I love card driven games with a fair amount of asymmetry and this game was so easy to grasp. I initially played it 1v1 with the pal and I was just kind of alright with the game. Yeah, the, the cards though were felt a little too bare bones for me. Plus, having one faction, putting it down, picking up the next, putting it down, picking up the next. It wasn't really that fun for me to grasp the big picture through this way, and not having teammates just made me lose a lot of the possible strategies. About two weeks later, I got the chance to play this on TTS with a full group of six, and then I was pretty darn impressed with how the team play just mixes really well with the game's simplicity. I could get into that roleplay of recreating World War II with my friends, as I try to push in the Pacific against all those Japanese traps, and then my friend over there in Moscow is just telling me not to worry too much about Germany because he has a grand plan to do a massive frontal assault. The Italians and Germans keep complaining with one another on who should push forward, and then your team is talking about four fronts they want to pursue, but of course you only have one action to do on your turn. The cards and the map just feel so interconnected, especially with that six player count. But I did start to lose some steam after a while. Due to the game's simple one card a turn premise, there's no sustained progression to hold 100% of my interest after an hour in. There's usually not cool combos you can pull off, sometimes you just get dull draws, or your turn is actually exactly the same as last turn as you just build a piece your opponent killed. Remember, it's never the case where you can just move units on their own, which is there to reduce complexity, but man do I wish there was a little more options when you get cards screwed. It seems that I'll probably get the expansion at some point to increase the complexity. As of right now, I'm always going to use the house rule that I mentioned in the nitpicks to end the game a little bit early. So this all being said, if the game wasn't World War II, it'd probably be like a, like a 6. But it's freaking World War II! It's freaking World War II for 6 with all the awesome team play still. I think my score might go up as everyone gets more familiar with the decks and games go faster. But man, Quartermaster General is such a blessing for me because it's so easy to set up and teach. There's replayability with all the different decks. I just get to share this momentous era of history with my friends. Under two hours. I can mix and match my friends playing the Soviets or the Italians or the Germans. The list goes on and on on how you want to do teams, what faction you want to play, how you're going to pursue your strategy. It's pretty darn cool. So I'm not going to be playing this game if I don't have five or six people, but now I can get rid of Axis and Allies, because Quartermaster General has entered the collection. As always, shout out to our patrons for making videos like this possible. We got 
Whew. John S. Manuel G. Brian C. Clifford H. Aaron W. Max B. Boria. Jeremy M. C. Charlie B. Quentin S. Sam S. Travis R. Alvin Y. Bumsy K. Brian D. Jeffrey L. Quackalop. Ram. Matt. <laughs> Matt G. Peter C. Spinner 71. Ryan J. Brad G. Tiamo period. Mark A. Nathan C. And James M. And we got two Mad Lads of Cardboard. We got ZL and Jeff L. We got one Mad Lady of Cardboard. We got Amy. Thank you guys so much. If you want to pick up Quartermaster General, we got purchase links in the description below if you want to help us out. So don't forget to subscribe, ring that bell, and like the video. And let me know about any games you'd like us to review or any cool war game memories or strategies you have. Anyways, see you later. Bye-bye.